And this week we're going to be interviewing a longtime coach, friend, associate, Dave Anderson. Our first interview. Dave it's a Anderson. phone call. Yeah, we'll have to wait to get him on the phone to tell our listeners why we're interviewing him first. All right. Are we ready for this? I'm ready. We're going to give Davey Boy a call here. All right. David Anderson, Minot, North Dakota. Here we go. There's one ring. It's ringing. It's working. Dialing. Hello. David Anderson, welcome to our podcast. Steve and Andy. Andy, Steve, thanks for having me. Yeah, we yeah. want to tell you, you're our, we're newbies with the podcast, and you're our first guest. I want to tell you why is we're going in alphabetical order. And uh, Well, I yeah, that makes perfect sense. As far as last names go. As far as last names go. So some people, you know, Gary Alpert, Tim Adams, there's 11 people ahead of you. but And then with Anderson, we, we have seven Andersons, but with D.A., you know, we got Robin and Roger, a lot of Andersons, but... Uh, Robin's father, Denim, he's D-E. So D-A, uh, our listeners, we have uh, we have David on first. We can tell you lots of reasons why we picked Anderson first, but let's start with quotes from his father. We already told our listeners you're from Minot, North Dakota. I never was privileged, honored to meet your late father, Hank. But why don't you give us a quote? I'll give you one that I use of his. I quote people all the time. Correct me if I'm well, wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Let, let <laughs> go me, ahead. Let me give you one. Is uh, lead off here. I've spent my life telling all the right things to all the wrong people. Is that correct? That that's very close. Yeah, he he said, uh, you know, you basically can't say the you can't say the right thing to the wrong person or wrong people. And uh, then he conversely he always said, you you know, you can't say the wrong thing to the right people. And uh, I'll put a couple. You know, I think that things. yeah, it's 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 basically the same context, but it. It, it's so true, and I, I think in the last probably decade of my life, I think I've realized how true it is in that uh, I think I spent a lot of time and energy trying to, you know, basically talk to a wall um, sometimes <laughs> and, 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 and just found myself frustrated when, you know, common sense would have dictated that I should probably shake the dust off my feet and move away. <laughs> and uh, that was that was something that he said often. With, uh, give us a couple more Hank Anderson quotes. Well, I mean, he, these aren't Hank Anderson originals probably, but they he used to always, uh, you know, talk about, I mean, every parent I think has told their kids the grass, you know, the grass isn't greener. And he used to just say, if the grass, if the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, you better get busy, busy fertilizing, mowing and pulling weeds. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was uh, up where I grew up in North Dakota. It, you know, it was just one of those environments where you pretty much learn to put your head down and get your work done. And and uh, um, I think that, you know, I wouldn't have traded it for anything, really, because even though it may not have been the ideal breeding ground for uh, tennis, but uh, I think there were so many great qualities that come out of living up there in, in pretty adverse conditions really throughout a, a big portion of the year survive the winters my father used to yeah, say, I mean, if you chop if you chop wood all day you'll have a, a pile of wood <laughs> With, yeah, the uh, other the yeah that the other thing he used to always you know about how you know it it, it just basically comes down to his, his version of saying um actions speak louder words but louder than words but he'd say I can't, I can't really hear what you're saying anymore over what you're doing mm. and, uh, little things and, you know, people phrase it different ways. And, but those are, those are three that come to mind. Here's one. My father used to say, I think it sums up the tennis industry. The cream comes to the top, but the so's BS if you stir it. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. I, I've heard you say that one many times. <laughs> it's a good thing. There's not a whole lot of that in the tennis industry though. <laughs> no, no, it's just a lot of cream. Well, hey, um, no, I mean, just for our listeners, to give you them a little bit of background where you are, you're at Brookhaven Country Club in Texas, and I know Steve's been there quite a few times, I'm several times. His, times. Oh, his I, son has been there living with you, and I think, I, you know, I was there uh, competing years ago in the 90s, and the Junior Nationals at Brookhaven was held there. Yeah, I think we, I thought it out, I, I think you've been there 27 years now, is that right? 20, yeah, I think October 11th is 28. And but, be going on twenty nine, yeah. 
Yeah, Andy said he played the National League teams. I remember you and I and others, uh, after Thanksgiving on Thursday, we would go in and, and watch the indoor Nationals because we were 100 miles away in Tyler, Texas at, at that time. Yeah, David DeLucia won it that year. I think I remember, uh, I remember a couple of like ugly bald guys checking them out some of my matches. I may not have been bald then, but I have to say that... <laughs> Uh, 93, 94, I would have been working here then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I remember going up there with Steve and we were watching Delusia and uh, Scott Perlman was coaching Kansas then and looking to recruit him. That's cool. Yeah, I remember Ty, that, that particular year, Ty Tucker was there. Ty uh, Tucker, yeah. With um, Tell us a little bit about the facility. Tell us more about Brookhaven. Yeah, so, Club so, Corp. Well, I mean, it, yeah, it, it's under the umbrella. It was Club Corp flagship club uh and they as you know own hundreds of clubs throughout the world now and mm -hmm. and uh but i mean brookhaven um if, if you love tennis it's a great place to be i mean it uh tomorrow is going to be basically 100 percent chance of rain you know we have 17 different courts with a roof on it mm -hmm. and um when when it isn't raining we have just you know incredible space with our uh, 40 plus outdoor courts uh, i mean our total courts and and we have clay and uh, as with many places now we've also added pickleball and uh great fitness facility um we have a uh, massive golf program as well 318 whole golf courses and as many people know jordan spieth spent mm -hmm. most of his youth out here and um, but it, it, it's been a, it's been a great, uh, situation for me, um, to, to be able to, you know, I, I feel like every day is, is really never a repeat of, of the previous day. So it, it's been a constant challenge. Um, when I came here, there were two pros mm -hmm. roughly on staff and now we have, uh, just under 25 full-time pros. So, wow. um, it's growing quite a bit. Yeah, not many pros stay in one place that long. So kudos yeah. to you. Tell us well, about um, Brook uh, Club Corp. There, we, you know, I think they own more courts or operate more courts than any company in the, any company in the United States. Yeah, I think there's others that have made that claim, but Club Corp, uh, you know, certainly owns more tennis courts, operates more tennis courts, really than any anyone in the world, I believe, um, at this point and. Uh, they were fortunate to be led by a good friend, uh, Eric Appel, who retired as our CEO. And then uh, uh, there's been a, a new CEO, David Pillsbury, who's been appointed. Uh, Billy Freer, who was our director of tennis here for many years, uh, recently retired, but he's still the national advisor for the tennis. And, and Dave Ware, who assumed Billy's role um, you know, my tenure at Brookhaven Pales really in comparison. Dave has been here, I think, 36 years mm. and, and literally knows uh, his, his, his skill set for uh, the tennis industry. The tennis business is incredible. There, I think there are very few that are as well-rounded as he is. Mm. I worked at a club corp, uh, the Cota de Casa Golf and Racquet Club, for about six months. Yeah, and it that's a where. Beautiful uh, place. Yeah. I think I met Eric, yeah. possibly. But, uh, mm -hmm. oh, David uh, David Pate is out there. Yeah, is that Pate, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. one thing with our listeners is uh, trench pros. I know that you teach tennis from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun goes down, and the production of players. Uh, and again, I've been at your place many times. I've I've sent so many students out there, including my son Connor, who's spent a, a ton of time there. What about um, the number of college players, that poster you have back where the ball baskets are? How many is it? 300, 400? Well, yeah, I, I couldn't give you an exact number. I, I really have never even counted them. But um, that poster, we have a big wall that kind of pays tribute to, uh, you know, some of the alumni that have been through and gone off and played college tennis. And, and uh, it was a project I gave to a pro who I won't, won't name um years ago and and gave him a a list and he, he somehow the list was uh disappeared and and we were never able to track it down so i had to kind of go off the top of my head and put together 
uh, a pretty good chunk of it. I, I think I'm, I'm probably lacking 20, 25 percent. But I, my guess is there's probably 400 um, if it were top to bottom over the last 28 years. Yeah, right in there. I think that's an untold story in, in American tennis. Um, with Dallas is so, so it's like a, I think it's like a city unto itself. It's so big. Uh, Dallas and Fort Worth are obviously, um, you know, it's like one big metroplex. What about the pros that you've trained? I mean, there's obviously they're, they're all over Dallas now. I, I mean, there's coaches out there that I've trained. Um, um, how many pros have you trained that are now working elsewhere in that greater Dallas area? Or how many oh, pros? I mean, there's, I mean, yeah, the, yeah, there's, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I think I could just stop the top of my head and name 10 or 15 places that have a, a pro that was formerly part of our, our environment here. And then in addition to that, like you said, there's several pros that uh, found their careers here that went through training with you back in uh, uh, the tennis tech era. And I mean, it, there, there's an incredible network of it uh, going on here. Um, I, there, well, let, let me say it this way. There could be an incredible network <laughs> going on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, uh, it, it really hasn't, uh, come into fruition like it, like it should, to be honest. But, uh, I, I think there's a pro, I could name a pro at, at, at a majority of the clubs that has some sort of background, either as a player here from our program or, or a coach. So do they, I mean, do they stay connected with you in any kind of way or, do you see that they yeah. continue to teach the same fundamentals and basics or do they kind of? Yeah, I, ways? I, I think to answer the first question, I think that some of them have stayed connected. Um, and I think that it's kind of a two way street in that I probably haven't stayed connected on my end either. Um, I think the tennis business has gotten so busy for everybody. It seems that sometimes those little things like that, that can make a big difference. Um, don't always happen. And so I, I take a bit of responsibility in that as well. But I think that for the most part, um, it, it isn't uh, uh, common for the, the people to go on and uh, immediately reach back and, and stay connected. I, I find it happens more often when they're in a little bit of a pinch. Um, and then I'll get some people coming back, doing some observation, things like that. Mm. Uh, but you know, it, I don't, I don't know if it's, uh, because we become territorial in the business or if it, uh, you know, simply becomes just, uh, a matter of 24 hours in a day. I don't know which one. I think it's probably different in a lot of cases, but, um, you know, it's, it's a sad reality of it. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so many factors. One thing I would say is Dallas traffic, getting getting players connected where they play one another. For our listeners, I, I've known David since 1985. And so we spent eight years working together, but actually it was the first three years on the same campus. But then in a neighboring town, David was running two clubs. And I always tell people we had the worst logo in tennis. It was just a light bulb. It's like, do you get it? Let's turn the light on. But also the term connected, you know, just bring people together. I think that's one thing that we're not team orientated enough to get um, people working together. Uh, Say, for example, um, Andy and I, right before the pandemic, we were going to go to, we were invited and we were looking forward to going out to Lakes Academy. Hmm. Um, The, I mean, that would be, do you have coaches that, that you've trained that work there? I know Nikki Johnson owns the place, right? Yeah, Nikki has uh, been the owner there for a couple of decades, I think, and certainly went through the great base training back in the Tennis Connection era that we were a part of. And then over at T-Bar M? Um, yeah, T-Bar, a number of people. Um. Oh, Jim Morgat's up there, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, Correct. Yeah. What's the young guy's name who did well at Kalamazoo? Uh, he played at LSU. Tam Trim. Yeah. And then Nallen. Yeah. Uh, 
John Nowen. John Nowen, yeah. I Karen mean, Boyd, who's the general manager, was uh, on our staff um, and left when uh, with Glenn Agritelli when he purchased T-Bar. So I'm just curious. I mean, if if you know, I haven't been to those clubs. If I were to show up there, as far as technique goes, I mean, are we going to see some familiar stuff, or is it going to be hit and miss? Well, you know, and I, I I'm not certain on what you'd see. I can speak on really just seeing products of people, mm-hmm. um, not having really observed them. But I think that what happens based on my experiences is that people start deviating um, from the system of the Great Base uh, and they start rationalizing it away um, because uh, I think it's a lot of hard work to try to get kids to stay the course. Mm. And, and, and so a coach has to be willing to work harder than yeah. the kids. And, and uh, I, I, my experience is showing me that people start to, to drift away from it gradually over time. And then uh, I think just like when a player leaves, uh, you guys or, or leaves our environment and they've been exposed to it at a high level of, you know, daily routines, things of that. I, I think that it takes a while for it to unravel. I don't think it unravels right away. And uh, I, I think that 12, 18 months go by and then all of a sudden you start to see a little bit of a, a little bit of a, 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 a change in, in certain things. And, and I think the same thing happens to tennis teachers, to be honest. If, mm-hmm. if you're not really careful, I think that it, it gradually unravels. And then, you know, some people just turn their head and hope it goes away, and, and it seldom does. I think with um, the two-year program we had, what happened with many of the graduates is their experience didn't match their education. They would go elsewhere, and they were, you know, just – very young and starting the industry. And, you know, in other words, the, the overhead became scratch your back and point, shuffle backwards. And so they weren't really even allowed to teach what they were taught. Um, yeah. And I, I, for, I know at your place, uh, I mean, there's so much opportunity in a big wealthy area of these Dallas is again, city unto itself. Is that, don't you think a lot of the coaches that worked for you that, they should have stayed around longer before they went and did their own thing. Yeah. I mean, it, I was thinking about that kind of concept, even prior to taking the phone call and being, being on here tonight with you guys in that, um, you know, the two years going back to my roots where, you know, the two years I got to spend at tennis tech and then lucky to get on there the third year with Tylee and myself being, um, asked to help out on staff and you know really um i mean it, it, it you're looking at in, in my opinion 10 years somebody needs to do some really hard work in terms of internships and learning and and uh and i think the way that we bring people into the tennis profession and the way that they are set up usually in terms of compensation And uh, I think it's becoming very, very difficult to attract people from this generation um, into the industry in in a manner where it could really set them up to be successful. And, I, you know, I think I I was telling we we have staff training and we've had to put it a little bit on hold um, in our group settings with the, the, the COVID. But I tell them all the time, I said, guys, if you if you only teach when you're paid, you're never going to master your craft until you're retired. And, uh, you know, t- tennis teaching, like tennis playing, I think becomes a lot more fun when you start to really get a handle on it. And, and you know, it, it becomes really an incredibly rewarding process. And, and I think that, it, I think that the average person doesn't quite get a handle on the true art of tennis teaching, but you know, it, it comes down to growing the game. I mean, we, we all could teach all day, every day if we wanted to, it's just, uh, 
we're not going to get paid for every hour. And I've, you know, personally made it a point to, to continue to do pro bono work nonstop through my whole life. It's the right thing to do, I think. And you get to master your skill a little bit better. I'm still trying to help Steve with his forehand grip. If, well, uh, some projects, some projects are, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like me growing hair. We've, we've got, uh, <laughs> just too much bad myelin. Back in the day, people would just say, use one grip. It's simpler. And boy, it sounded simpler. With Andy and spending your time in Europe, uh, it's, it's, it's loyalty, how people will stay with the program. And again, in, um, I say Spain, for example, where, you know, the coaches are more unified. And it, that it's not, and I think that's obviously one great thing that's appealing. A lot of foreign players come to play college tennis here and they really fall in love with the United States because it, it's such an individualistic, individualistic lifestyle. But um, it, it is key when you say, you know, to get the pros connected and you know, working together. Um, and I do think there's, it becomes too much, you know, they, the coach who's out at the tennis tournaments on the weekend, handing out their business card and they're a merchant of flesh and they're recruiting people who can already play instead of getting more kids in and teaching beginners and, um, you know, the kids at your club. And I mean, I think a lot of times the higher people up are, the higher they are in seniority on a ladder, the less they work with the beginner, the developmental side of it. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? I, I, I mean, I can tell you this, it's a lot easier to find a perceived high performance coach than it is a early childhood development coach. Um, you know, and, uh, I think that we're, we're fortunate here and that, you know, we have some really good pros working from the early childhood program up, um, Dion, as you know, uh, Steve, Dion, like myself was trained under Steve and, um, I don't know, Andy, if you've met Dion, but he's so. been here. Dion Krupe. Yeah, he's, he's been here just about the same length of time as, as I have. Um, but he, you know, recently on his own accord said he wanted to get back into uh, more of the the grassroots part of our program, what we call Academy Prep. And, and so Dion has been heading that up. And, and to see the impact he's been able to have on that in four or five months has been um, really incredible. And I think it's not only impacted the kids, but I, I, I'm hoping that the, some of the pros that are around him um, are picking up ideas and getting more tools for their belt too. But, yeah. No, I mean, we've always talked about that usually with the, the tiny tots or the younger kids that it's usually the lesser experienced pros that are put with them. And it really, it should be the most experienced or the directors. Yeah. Get no, those kids no, yeah. Start. no substitute for a good beginning. Yeah. I mean, there is no substitute for it. Look at Steve's forehand. Look at my, my forehand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same boat. <laughs> with, um, but in in Europe, Andy, why don't you tie it in with? Uh, no, Europe was. I mean, in Germany. You know, I spent the last four years living in Germany, and I got on um, a club team, and uh, you know, I had a blast. And and we had a small club that was just a few, really a few blocks down from our house, um, TC Garrison, and uh, we had a great group of guys, and and we were competitive and had fun. And for me, that was the best experience that I've had in, in tennis, other than, you know, playing for a team college tennis is, is obviously great. But, um, yeah, just competing, having fun, and then everybody staying together after to have a dinner or lunch together, you know, win or lose. It was just all about getting out there and playing and, and enjoying the game. And, um, yeah, the loyalty is there, whether you're a junior or, you know, in a women's team, men's team, everybody proudly represents their – their club, their uniform, and I had a blast. You know, they, the expression, stay the course, start the course, stay the course. How about Dallas as far, or greater Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth, about shopping and bopping? Do kids uh, well, go from one yeah, to I the think, next? I think, uh, so 28 years is a long time, and I can remember Dallas in different phases, and when I arrived here there were really there was really no academy format and and uh <clears throat> so it was it was a pretty new concept having said that you know there were still junior programs sprinkled throughout the city and 
and I was fortunate. Dallas Morning News came out and 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 said uh, they wanted to do an article on this academy concept. And and I remember uh, in the article I said in the second paragraph, and it came out on the the Sunday edition, which is a big big paper in Dallas, and and it was on the front page of the sports. And in the second paragraph, I, I was quoted as saying that my number one goal was to break the country club mentality in Dallas. And I remember sending it to my parents and my dad with his one liner said, I hope your resume is updated. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, I'd rather find out now than later. Yeah. And, and so back then, um, you know, it was a little bit like Steve and I had in East Texas where, you know, kids didn't really have too many bop and shop options, uh, not only in tennis, but just with things to do. And, and that's probably why too, national champions evolved out of those programs there um in 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 the collegiate ranks but uh that's how it was here for for quite some time and i remember actually steve i don't know it might have been 12 13 14 years ago maybe more but i remember saying that dallas was quickly turning into south florida and uh because it was kind of like all the all the different places that were popping up and i think it's been that way in youth sport in general in america in the last two decades where everything has become a business and um you know people have realized there's opportunities to make money which isn't necessarily a bad thing but um when it's a, when it's for the you know when it takes away from the good of the game i think it uh, or the good of the individual playing the game then i think it becomes a problem and you know with with Dallas, uh, with all the opportunities that people do have now, I think that with the uh, typical attention spans from not only kids, but, you know, the, the, the parents of kids this age aren't that old anymore. They, everybody used to seem old to me if they're a parent. Now they're all younger. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I think that those combinations and being a fairly affluent city um, give people a lot of uh, uh, temptation and doing some things that ultimately keep them from staying the course. And, you know, we inherit people the same way. And I always try to do background checks and, and see, you know, what the program that they came from is saying about them. Mm. Um, because when, you know, when they're, they're shutting one door and trying to open another. and Usually there's two sides or three sides to every story. Yeah. I do remember you used to say, and again, I've been to Brookhaven many, many, many times. And when you pull up to Brookhaven, I mean, you feel like you're in a small tennis city because it's just tennis, tennis, tennis. And you do have to go maybe another 500 yards up the road. That used to be your line. The country club, it's a mile down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Country clubs across the street. Yeah. I always tell kids, if you you can charge French fries to your parents' account, (laughs) it's probably not the right place to be. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, that's why... You know, it was it was kind of a unique time during COVID, but uh, you know, it was just we were open, but uh, in a very limited capacity. So there was no entrance into the buildings, et cetera. Water jugs were removed, um, and I think you know, for me, it was kind of a throwback to my roots, where I used to have to fill a you know a tin can of uh, old pen tennis balls with water <laughs> from a hose at the public courts to to drink and i i actually loved it to be honest um but yeah i think that we're we're in a we're in a time of abundance and i don't think it's helped anything from any coach's end that is serious about helping people become the best they can become you know coming back to nikki johnson at lakes they had won an award for having you know x amount of players at nationals used to gives that out every year and he wanted it wanted uh the two of us to come out to uh, work with the younger players, the, the developmental side. Um, how, how about the girl that you worked with? I remember uh, a- Ashlyn Kruger, correct? Mm-hmm. Ashlyn, yeah. Oh, uh, she just won. Well, the pandemic kind of throws things off, but I mean, it's hard to think that the French Open is going to be played in September. But mm-hmm. she she won back to back titles at the Eddie Her the Orange Bowl. I remember bringing uh, Victor Lilov off to your up your place and they both played when they were 11 um you know and she's over at the lakes now is 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 she someone with like dave lickard is is he in communication with you with her tennis 
No, huh? I have had little, I mean, I've had none, uh, really, in communication about that with Dave. I know Dave well and mm-hmm. watched him when uh, he was competing in juniors. He was actually in that age group with, uh, you know, right under Clayton and all those guys that were part of our tennis connection. Clayton's but dad. I haven't, uh, mm-hmm, yeah, they were, they were in the same general age group. But I haven't uh, heard a word from really anybody on that. Um, yeah, I, I think but, when, when people, you know, for whatever reason, you know, maybe under your corporate structure, for whatever reason, uh, I always tell people if they if you leave, like say maybe you're going to, you know, have more one on one with your own sparring partner, whatever it may be, better match play. Uh, but they should circle back and continue to work off of video. Because that's just how the brain works. And as far as myelin, you know, you don't want to, you know, deprogram, reprogram. And, um, you know, so I was just, you know, curious with, with her because. Um, yeah, well, it's so important. And, you know, this, yeah, I, there's a young girl, I, you know, one door opens, another one sh- or shuts, another one's op- opening. And uh, a young girl that I started working with right around the first of the year, and they had been in an environment where they took daily lessons. And um, so I was working with this player kind of on a similar schedule to what they had encountered and uh, put it, you know, with, with some of the apps that are available and coaches, I, where you can put the audio right on and send it to their phone. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I must have put 30, 40 of these videos together really giving the kids an in-depth analysis of their own game. And, and so it, 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 I think that it's amazing to me with all of the opportunities that people have, even, you know, with stuff like that, or, you know, it, I, I'm a firm believer that Brookhaven, even in our membership, uh, a player would seldom have to leave to get to be the best they could be. I mean, there's just, there's so many good players inside of our membership that might be 35, 40 years old, 45 years old. Um, in addition to these really young staff members that still hit the ball great. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and like this girl that I, this, this player that I was referring to that I, I'm teaching, I mean, I told her parents, I said, listen, I'm going to, there's no lessons anymore until mid October. And I said that back in September, I said, until this player digs deep within themselves, I, I said, nothing's going to work. And, and, uh, you know, Andy, my wife, Jenna is a personal trainer by trade. And mm-hmm. in our home that Connor lived in Steve's son, uh, on the wall, there was a weight room and on the wall, my wife had wrote, nothing will work unless you do. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think that we've forgotten that. And I think that people have forgotten that. And it's not about the private lesson. I think Billie Jean King, you know, when she said that's one of the most dangerous terms in tennis. Um, I do a lot of private lessons, but it's not in the, you know, it, it's, it's kids have learned to eat that like a, a Skittle. And uh, they're not, I think it's devalued information. Yeah, I like to tell uh, people, parents and players, that in a lot of ways you'd be better off with 12 five-minute lessons yeah uh but i, I yeah. know like you know nikki johnson and dave licker obviously decades have gone by they have so much experience and i think obviously to be open to work with um it's always just you know continuous learning not to use my name in third person dave, but uh doug cash i've heard him say many times um if you're a student of steve smith's you're a student of his the rest of your life whether you want to be or not <laughs> and I, I don't know if our listeners would really understand that unless they knew the details and they like, they're going to, you know, watch what the racket is doing, you know, yeah. watch how the ball is traveling is that is not true topspin. And, but I think that's why they just need to circle back is, um, and you no, know, they say like, you know, I worked with Victor Lillo for five years and you know, I mean, you and I can maybe, you know, okay, let's, let's, let's say you name 20 and I'll name 20. We'll name 40 people. I got an email today where someone was asking about a young Canadian I worked with and they want to know whatever happened to him because he became the number one in the tens and the twelves and the fourteens. Um, um, Dylan Bernarczyk. 
And I spoke to mm-hmm. Dylan just last year, and um, Richard Hernandez, who was a classmate of yours, and I can't pronounce Dennis's last name, Dennis, like a Russian, born in his, you know, his oh, Shapovalov. Yeah, there you go, Dennis Shapovalov. <laughs> and I said, I, I said, Dylan, what happened? I said, I know, I know you're a year older, but you used to beat that guy 6'1", 6'1", 6'1", 6' love. You know, now he's you know, 21 years old. I and mean, this was a year ago. And he said, I stopped listening. You know, and, and a, lot of people, mm. a lot of people don't know that Dennis was, you know, at Richard's club for 10 years. But, yeah. but it's like, you know, if I, I think you, you say it about college tennis is you say that I've heard you say many times about a college program is, well, they didn't get worse. Could you mm-hmm. expound upon that? What do you well, mean? I mean it. They don't. What do you mean? They, what uh, do you mean uh, by that, that? that? I think that the list of kids on the wall and the kids that I, I, you know, follow through college tennis that aren't even in our program and watching them all come back from various schools play in the Cotton Bowl each year, and um, I think that you know sometimes there's emotional maturity that, that's definitely present that. Uh, um, they've grown up a little bit. They're a little more mature at 21 than 17, 18. And, but as far as the games, um, I think that uh, I noticed a, a significant pattern that uh, the players themselves have gone on a, a downward path. Um, I've had so many kids go off to you know many, many of the top schools and asking them, uh, when the last time they've done drills of any sort or are they, are they watching video or are they doing any of that? And the answer is, uh, inevitably, no, uh, I just literally reconnected with a player who had a PAC 10 school and, um, was an incredible ball striker as a junior. And, and, uh, uh two days ago on the court. And I mean, the, quite the what I would term a, a very clean volley on both sides uh, going off and uh, they had left our program by the way uh, prior to the senior year in high school so it's been three years now and and, and there's just no trace of it and the volley is uh, completely gone and and the player told me they, they don't work on it number one and then number two what they did work on with occasionally was was really counterproductive and I just see it over and over again and it isn't, you know, there, there's some kids with just pure heart and passion that, that get better. Um, but it's definitely not like, uh, a trend that you see in college football or college basketball where, where you can just see this kind of systematic rise in a player. With, uh, I tell kids when they go to college, take a ball hopper. When you get there, jog around campus, ride a bike around campus, find where there's a backboard, you know, find where there's mirrors. You know, most of these kids who go to these prestigious schools, there's going to be squash courts, you know, you know, find a place where you could go and do these routines, Um, but never to just feel like you outgrow basics. And I think that happens so much with, with tennis players. Yeah. Well, I mean, most colleges are not going to slow things down. Um, I've spent a lot of time around, Ty Tucker and his, you know, the Ohio State boys. And uh, there's a couple of times where I was like, hey, you know, what's wrong with that guy's, what's wrong with that guy's backhand? Go, go fix that guy's backhand. It's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give him some tips, you know, for 10, 15 minutes. And, and then, you know, 15 minutes later, back with Ty. And he's like, all right, hit it as hard as you can. Hit it as hard as you can. So, you know, <laughs> it's just a little bit of instruction than destruction. But I just think most colleges are not set up to where they're going to work really on technique and, you know, slowing things down and breaking it yeah. down. They're just going to get, get the workouts in and work hard physically. No, I, I've said before in one of these podcasts we have, I love Ty Tucker, but he had, he does have players red shirt and that would be a time for a person really to slow down. But I think that's one thing about tennis players, tennis parents, probably more so than the players is, you know, it's almost like people are going in circles. It's like you're going nowhere fast. You, if you've got a hole in your game, better yet, if you have a hole in your boat, you don't put the sail up. You got to fix the hole in your boat. Um, but when yeah, and I, I put it on the kids. You know, I, I, all of that stuff we just talked about. I mean, I think the, 
you know, if a college coach were listening, they might think it's a shot at them. And, but the, you know, the, uh, those 400 kids on the wall or whatever number it is here, I, I hold everybody kind of accountable to it. And I, I mean, they know better. They're given that same, uh, uh, advice going in, uh, or, you know, and, and I always tell them in addition to that, just find the hardest worker on the team, immediately identify them. And that's your new best friend. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and I said, and seldom will it be the number one player. Yeah. And, uh, but I think that the players, you know, fall into that, it, it, this mode. I, I was watching, I was out watching a tournament this weekend here in town and, you know, 13, 14 UTRs in, in some of the guys. And, uh, um, uh, it's the, some good tennis, but you know, the, the scene is, is very much like kind of an, an organized athletic fraternity and sorority. And, uh, it just doesn't have the feel that you get from, from other sports. And, and I think tennis needs a little bit of that for sure. I think yeah. when, you, when you mentioned Ty or you mentioned, you know, Andy said Ty and, in, in some college coaches, you mentioned some college coaches listening to this and think we're taking shots, but there's a real art, especially with, with boys. Uh, I always ask who's smarter boys and girls. And the answer is girls because of car insurance it costs so much for a, a young boy to drive a car, but it's, you know, parents should really know players too. But when your child is 18 years old and now they're out of the house and they're on a college campus and the academic load, it's so, so important to really have your game down. You know, it's like, say, if somebody goes to Nick Terry's place, people call it the toughest playground in tennis. There really should be pre-academies where it's like, let's slow down and let's get this right in the early years. Um, the um, Yeah, no, I was just going to say, you know, not, not to take shots at college coaches at all. It's just the, the matter of fact is that, you know, they want to get players that are ready to go and they want to win and, and have some pressure to win. And it's, you know, yeah. You got to be you got to be ready to play by the time you're to that level. So I think it's it's more on the players. Obviously, it's nice if you can develop, but it's more on the players yeah. to to be able to do some of that stuff on their own and, and be. Yeah, I mean, it could be done. It can be done in sync too. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, there's living proof of that. One thing, with but college, it's uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say doubles. I think a lot of times, um, you know, tennis parents, tennis juniors. In those formative years before college, they don't know the significance of doubles. Um, when, you, when you and I are working together, um, in, you know, two neighboring towns, a hundred miles from Dallas, uh, Tyler, Texas, Longview, Texas. I remember we had four girls in the five A state doubles tournament. Now you would remember the scores probably. Yeah, it's amazing how this guy remembers scores, Dave Anderson. But it was. Uh, Laura Barrow, Carmen, Laura Barrow, Carmen Clark, Julie Scott, Lisa Kimmel. And mm -hmm. they were all serving volume. There's a nice gentleman, uh, Bob Faulkner. There's a tennis park named after him in Tyler, Texas now. And he used to come out to the Tyler Junior College courts. Or, and, I, and I was allowed to teach at several of the clubs. In fact, we taught at all the parks. Um, we had, at one point had over 100 students. Uh, we were always, always trying to be recognized as you know, that was not our motive at Tennis Town USA because what we had going on was truly unique. But he would come out wherever I was, he'd find me and he'd say, Steve, girls cannot serve in volley. <laughs> girls cannot serve in volley. And there was one girl, uh, Lisa Kimmel, that the, the high school coach uh, at that time told her to stay back. And, in you know, so it, she said, well, I'm told to go to the net. I have to go to the net. And the father, Lissa's uh, father, met with a high school coach and she didn't play for a year. So the, the coach came back to her and said, well, we'd like you to play. So she didn't play high school tennis for a year because um, the coach wanted her ser servants to stay back. Along those lines, we ran a junior college program for 10 years. And I, um, Chad Burial was in charge the last five years. And we had many kids that went on to play um, you know, so it's a two year school. So they went on to play their third and fourth year and every girl was told not, not almost every girl, but every girl after they spent two years with us going to the net, mm -hmm. they were told they couldn't go to the net. Yep. But, um, tell us that you had a, a group at Kalamazoo that did quite well when you're, 
and all I got three or four of them all in the finals. Who were they? Yeah. Well, one of them was uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, he's coaching at T-Bar now, Tam Tran, and he partnered with a young guy named Andrew Karinik, who uh, um, grew yeah. up in the program. I remember him. Pardon me? No, I remember him. You went to Texas, right? Yeah. He went to Texas, then transferred over to LSU. Okay. And uh, and then Shane Vinzant. Uh, was the third one from the program. And then he partnered, Shane was partnered uh, with Mitchell Kruger, who um, Shane and Mitchell were really almost uh, one and two in America that year. Shane won the Easter Bowl. Um, and uh, they even went on to, to make the finals of the, the French Open Juniors. Um, but but Tam, Andrew, and Shane, all three were uh, products of the program and, and – uh, all with very unique, different backgrounds and uh, um, certainly all had their own individual strengths. But uh, you had great Shane, kids, you, all of them. You had Shane at, at, at my place in Tampa. And I I like to ask people, okay, who's the best player you've played? Who's the best player you've practiced with? And I had no I had no idea what he was going to say, but I asked him, who's the best player you practice with? There's a lot of kids listening. And he, I think he was in town to play at Futures. And he, mm-hmm. he said, Roger Fetter. Um, yeah, he warmed, he warmed Fed up at Wimby. With, um, but the doubles, uh, I tell people the toughest thing about serving volleying and doubles today is to find someone else who serves in volleys and doubles. Um, he has a serving volley. Yeah. Do things you have to have well, be a serving volley or serving <laughs> volley. But to me, it's, it, to me it's, it, it's, it's a terrible state we're in now because, you know, that area even – Back when Julie and, and Carmen and and uh, and Lissa and Laura Barrow, when they were in the five A finals, I mean, all all four of those girls went forward, and there was there was some resistance, but it was nothing like it is now. And the, the sad part, the way doubles has been reduced to basically a set, and and the, the cumulative score of these mm. three sets add up to a point, and mm-hmm. and uh, then you go and watch local tournaments and there's just so little doubles being played overall and 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 people um are missing the point that you know we're 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 trying to develop all court skills and yeah and there's not going to be enough exposure i mean just like becoming a great tennis teacher i think requires instinct as well as the knowledge and 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 i think being a great player at the net undoubtedly is uh Number one, you got to hone the technique. Number two, you have to be there enough to develop instinct and, and the athletic ability. And 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 at the rate that this is all going, I mean, a kid a kid that's being told not to come in has no chance, and they're going to find themselves in a big singles match someday, and and they're going to have a forcing situation, and they're going to uh, hesitate because they haven't had the experience and the exposure, and and it's all intertwined, and that's the part I think that people miss. Yeah. What, what to say on, on the workout? What did Jenna have? It does, if it, if you don't work, it won't work. Nothing will work unless you do. You know, I think that's you know the age old problem is people become lazy. Someone who we sent out to spend some time at your place, Rush Ganji, he's here, and we're talking a couple of days ago, and he said they should have a consolation at Wimbledon, and I go, they used to. It was called the Wimbledon Plate. Hmm. It used to be it. it um, the major college tournaments, if you, you want, you win, if you want a point going to the champion side, to the right side of the draw, you get one point, but you'd be in the back draw and your team would get a half a point. We've got lazy. I mean, I just cannot understand how anyone with a tennis background, and I know people say, well, we want to get college tennis on TV, but I mean, six is not divisible by four. How could, a, how could, I mean, a pro set, okay, but even that, so yeah. Yeah, I, it, it doubles is diminished. Yeah, it's tough to see. It, it's really tough to see. That's why, you know, with the <clears throat> UTRs, um, we were uh, late in the game in terms of jumping on that ship and hosting them. And and uh, part of it was because I, I just felt the whole thing was saturated already. And, you know, there's six of them on any given weekend kind of within a 30 minute range here, which there's pluses to that too. But um, what we decided to do is, is basically we're holding uh, monthly doubles UTRs 
Mm-hmm. And giving the kids the exposure. And we just had one this weekend. Roger Anderson is doing a great job of coordinating that. The but good, uh, The good looking Anderson. <laughs> my, yeah, my son. <laughs> <laughs> when we play doubles together, that's what people think. He's my son. He played at LSU, correct? He, yeah, he was a great player. He had wins over many, many players. In fact, he junior or uh, uh, Christian Harrison, um, Kudla. He had a lot of great doubles wins in juniors, especially in the younger age groups, 14, yeah, 16. Yeah, was, my, when my son was out there, they were big buddies back in the day. Right. With I uh, try to keep him out of trouble. Yeah, with um, <laughs> doubles troubles. Let's move on to advice for parents. Yeah, I mean, I know... Uh, we're keeping on the line here. We've got a few other questions we want to go through with you. No, that's... And I know parenting is a, is a big one. We know you've worked with hundreds and hundreds of players and you could easily double that number with, when we talk about parents, but maybe any parents listening or coaches listening, maybe just some advice for parents. Well, I think I would go with a, <laughs> a quote and I can't, can't recall where I've heard this one, but I think that, I'll take credit. Number one, they they should go. They they should remember one thing most uh, above all, and that is facts have no feelings. Mm. And you know, facts just don't have feelings. And and somewhere along the line, um, it's become more about feelings and less about facts. And mm. you know, it. Uh, looking back, I mean, it. I I can tell you that. I, I can, in in my, I don't know, I guess I'm entering my fifth decade, not 50 years, but fifth decade of coaching tennis. And, and uh, um, I don't recall having a very high number of parent meetings in my first 25 years of coaching, maybe even my first 30. It seems like throughout the past 10 to 15 years, I find myself in a lot of parent meetings. Um, not parent meetings that I'm calling, but parent meetings that are being uh, requested from the end of the parent or the player. And and I think that there's, I'm, I'm a big believer in a c- communication, but I'm also a big believer in 1,440 minutes in a day. Mm. And and that uh, when, when there's things that need to get done, there's just things that need to be, get done. So I think that facts, separating the facts and the feelings, um, you know, it's hard for people. Uh, it, it's kind of like if Steve or I went and looked under the hood of a car, because I know his mechanical abilities are about like mine. Mm-hmm. And we would just really be uh, truly at the mercy of a mechanic that would tell us anything. We could we could be lacking blinker fluid or a muffler belt. And uh, and, and we'd, we'd say, put it in and let's get it done. And, and I think that that's, that's where people are. And, and, and we all know that you know, the the kind of people, like I was saying, that are typically getting into the tennis industry in this generation, from what I see here, are just really coming fresh out of the college ranks with no uh, right. no history of teaching and coaching and understanding uh, what this is all about. And yet they do have one thing that is very, very sexy, and that is um, many of them can still hit the ball well and play the game well. And, and uh uh, that gives instant instant credibility, in my opinion, to um, yeah. yeah. I was going to say a lot and of parents. now with that as well with the internet. Um, you know, you can get a website up or an Instagram account. You know, yeah. and if you've got if you're an extrovert, you've got some energy. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, it's, you know, making videos too and interpreting things. Or I always laugh. I look at some pictures where you know they'll tell, take a still shot of a player and and just sort of point out the obvious. You know, like elbow bend and. You yeah know, whatever just kind of like focused look yeah you know, there's, the not lot, or whatever. there's not a lot of it's rationale like, yeah i've always wanted to make a picture that's just like okay you know hat brown eyes eyebrows whatever you know it's just funny i like well that. it'd be hard it's hard to argue with the stuff that you know the content that you're putting on your instagram and then you know the post that steve has and and uh you know, we recommend all our players follow it, and um, yet I think a small portion of them do. And I quiz them. 
No, it's nice of you to say, yeah. you know, yeah, we're really just, we're trying to deliver some facts. You know, a good exercise to improve one's memory is just make it a story. You, you, you learn something like when, where, why, from who. Uh, a young tennis coach, he's not so young now, but maybe it was a decade ago, a South African, Greg Lesur, Um He said that it just, just was so, rang so true. We're talking and he said, well, with most college players, start to coach or they try to play pro tennis and you know they do that for a year or two and they end up coaching that they coach the way they trained at the end you know okay let's do some down the lines let's do some cross courts let's play some tie breakers and then they show up and you know they've got 12 nine-year-olds looking at them and they and they they don't remember how they were trained it's like with roger Federer, if you wanted to ask how were you trained when you were eight? You wouldn't need to ask his mother, Lynette. You wouldn't ask him. I know what, what eight year old is going to say, yeah, this is what I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But no, I think that's well, great it, facts and feelings. Yeah. Facts don't have feelings. Well, and I think that, you know, the typical 16 year old in, 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 in America right now playing tennis. I mean, I, one, one thing and Steve, you know, Dave Severson, he always, came up with some great one-liners, but he'd say nobody, nobody's ever as good or as bad as they think they are. He said, you know, a lot of, a lot of people think they're worse than they are, but he said the typical uh, kid in America right now thinks they're just much better than they really are. And so he always put it on both ends of it. And, and, uh, and I think people are surrounding themselves with teams uh, of physios and, 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 and psychologists and, and nutritionists and, multiple coaches, uh, hitting partners, they're, they're treating themselves at a, at a very different stage of their development, like their Novak Djokovic mm. at the, at its final stage. And I, I think it's, it's really confusing to people. I remember Dave Sievertson, he was, uh, for years a tester where we, we were breaking records at Tyler junior college certifying so many pros every May. So so many years went by and then I reconnected with Dave through you. And obviously he's continued to play and he plays well. He's one of the better players in the country. Um, so he's exceptional, but that's in thinking about him, youth versus veteran matches. Um, that's Pardon my, me? Youth versus vet, veteran matches. So the young kid playing the older kid or the young kid, yeah. young kid playing, well, the 14 year old playing the 44 year old. Um, it seems like that doesn't happen anymore. Kids aren't making phone calls. I, I think the NTRP has been a good model for, social adult tennis, but that's really separated the juniors and the adults too much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we continue to do it here almost every day. Um, we have, uh, you know, just, it's been kind of a, a nice marriage between the club and that, um, many of the better adults come out and I'll even have, you know, three Oh three, five ladies come out and play against some of the kids that are just getting going. It's, so it's, you know, just the variety, but, mm-hmm. We used to host an event. I called it Wisdom versus Wheels. And uh, That's good. <laughs> we're, we're going to actually uh, look at putting it back in play in, in 2021 and give credit to a name that is kind of a Texas tennis legend who's, who was my neighbor up until a month ago, and that is uh, Dick Landenberger, who you know, represented the yeah, U.S. Really. all over the world and in senior play. And he's 81 now, and, and I, I mean, you talk about a student of the game. He just revamped his serve and he serves I'll, I'll shoot video of it and send it to you guys because he basically took up a left-handed serve as a dominant righty because he had no ability to serve anymore with his right side hmm. and uh and it's clean <laughs> it's clean he used to always be on that ball machine next to that with court number is it court number court four? number 13, 13 court 13 yeah he's yeah. uh still on it every day every single day so i have him every day to reach out and speak to the kids that are around me anyway. In some cool. ways it, he, it really, it's a, speak to the kids, but if it was society, you could slow down a little bit more and have them speak to the parents. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the snow like you did and I went to a prep school that has its own ski uh, school, but I never skied, but I had to have it explained to me that the, the snow plow parents where they kind of clear, <laughs> yeah. clear the path. Hmm. But mm-hmm. we always tell you know, the helicopter parent really is a submarine parent is that with your comment on 
um, feelings, facts, how, uh, say it in <laughs> facts, not feelings, <laughs> facts, not feelings that, you know, the parents are coming to the rescue and every time they come to the rescue, the kid becomes weaker. Um, yeah, so I think that's when you say there's so many meetings, um, it needs to be less talk and more action. Yeah. How about the level of junior players? So, you, you know, five decades, I, I'm a decade older than you, basically. Um, you think it's going up well, or down? You know, uh, you know, the kids, how they played in the 80s versus how they're playing today? I mean, it's a tough question. I mean, I think that you're definitely seeing one more, more one-dimensional play now. I mean, it's... Uh, sure. You know, at the tournament I was at, I was watching, there were a couple of kids that played at UT uh, on the national championship team and a few from TCU and, and uh, you know, big time colleges. And But pretty much whatever court I was looking at, it was it was almost a repeat of the, of the next court in that uh, I saw a handful of people doing anything mid-court in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was there watching a young player in our program, Alex Cairo, who, you know, just turned 16 and is very well skilled. And, and you know, he lost uh, 14 12 in, or he lost in a third set tiebreaker, which, again, don't even get me started on that. I don't understand why they can't play a third. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, and I just told him at the end, I said, he didn't stand out enough. He, he, didn't, he didn't go forward enough. I said, if you wanted to stand out in that, group of players all you would have had to do was go forward more frequently because opportunities there um so I, I personally i think that the level isn't as high um but it you know when i look at you know the quality that some of the players can hit off the ground maybe they're hitting the ball a little bigger maybe um but uh it's really a moot point because ultimately they're not doing anything with it when the opportunity arises. You know, you mentioned Alex Cairo that comes back to, what we're talking about, you know, being connected. Uh, I talked to Brandon Flanagan today. He just called me up for some advice and uh, he's in Boynton beach and he started Alex and then his parents ended up going from that part of Florida to your part of Texas. And this yeah. summer, I, you know, through you, I mean, he went to some ITFs and, I know we, we connected him with uh, two different cities, two different programs to go and train. But that's the type of thing that I was referring to is that, uh, and we, 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 we need to have that more in American tennis where the, the coaches uh, work together. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be a, it, you just think about this city. I mean, we could connect the dots and, and, and form lines throughout the whole city really with people who have, had significant background in the great base um, at some point in their life as a player or a coach. And, and now they're coaching and um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's been kind of intriguing to me how it, it hasn't happened at all. And uh, I re- maybe it will. I remember um, watching the world cup and listening to the soccer experts afterwards and they were saying to develop soccer in the United States, uh, one person said what they should do is just, you know, pick a, a certain state or a certain lar- a large city and say, okay, this is how we're going to do it systematically. This is how we're going to work together. I can remember um, Tommy Fye create an opportunity. And the idea was to have you and Craig Tiley, the three of us, to go to Salt Lake City. And one of the theories was a theory of isolation. It's a beautiful place, but it's really isolated. It's, it's not Miami. It's not LA. It's a little bit away from the hotbeds of tennis. Um, you know, I think uh, Lifetime, uh, the company that's based in Minneapolis, they were talking to me one time. That was intriguing to me. It never happened, but they were talking to me about, um, and I said, I, I would be interested in being in Minneapolis as a base because they had eight clubs where they could all work together. Um, I, Andy and I, we went to, uh, a group of us went to Memphis. Um, I do think that's a problem though. Um, you know, where, you know, like they like say with Alex Cairo, I mean, he obviously, um, he should be able to go to all the different facilities where you've trained the coaches and they're all very much speaking the same language. It's not like, well, I've got this slant and this is, this is, 
you know, how, you know, I add my secret sauce and the, <laughs> this is how the recipe becomes better. And it's, that's just really, I think, more marketing than is anything else. Physics are a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I know, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, we've taken a lot of your time, but my last question for you, um, and it's, again, it could be a whole episode, but to help American tennis, what would be one or two ideas to help American tennis? Well, I know you're a you're a movie buff, yes, Andy, uh, and that's a conversation we can have in person when I come down and visit y'all, yep, some night. But uh, I would say that the movie Back to the Future. Yeah, I think we got to we got to go back to go to the future. Um, I think there's just been. Uh, you know, when you lose your keys, you, you kind of just retrace your steps to see, uh, you know, where, where, where were you last and, and keep going back till you find your keys. And I think we've just lost our keys. Mm. And, uh, I think that we have to go backward. Actually, we have to reflect on, a, on, on some of those things that we've even touched on here. Um, and, and I, I, I would put doubles at a very, very high, uh, priority list on that because, with doubles, the way doubles is intended to be played, um, you know, we could get back to to developing uh, kids in a manner where they're going to be able to enjoy the sport at a higher level. And um, but uh, you know, it the, it's it's a sad it's a sad thing. I mean, there's 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 numerous things, but to me, doubles comes to the front of my mind. Uh, I think that. There needs to be, as Steve said, a, a unified approach inside of a city, but inside of our, um, I mean, we are a big country and that's, that's a plus and a minus. And if, if, if we knew that every single young player that grabbed a racket under the age of 12 right now in the United States for the next 10 years, every kid that was starting the game or was even playing the game already was going to be uh, getting the same kind of treatment and information that you're giving to people down there in Orlando or that we're trying to give here in Dallas. Um, if we knew that was happening, I think in 10 years, that question wouldn't even have to be asked. Um, especially if we, again, I think altered the course of doubles and where it's headed. Um, I think that that combination of things, but, uh, you know, a lot of egos would have to, be violated and or checked in and um in order for that to happen i think i got to start working on a uh, flex capacitor <laughs> <laughs> maybe slip and hit yeah. my head in the toilet and that, that, that's yeah. a great way to start the back to the back to the future we have a young boy visiting here uh from texas his father grew up actually playing tennis he knows the story of uh clayton stanley and um Chad Clark, they both were playing at Texas uh, at the same time. So from our small guinea pig program to have two kids be in the lineup, um, when it comes down to his son the other day said, and he's just, he's, he's a very good little player. He's 11 years old, just turned 11. And he said, serve plus one. And I looked at him and I said, that's like swearing around here. Don't say, mm -hmm. serve, don't say serve plus one. And, you know, I know Craig O'Shaughnessy, who you know, he's done a, a great job with stats and, you know, getting it out there and people thinking more about statistics. But every time I hear that, you just think some kid, 11 years old, arching his back, tossing the ball over his head. He thinks he's hitting a, a serve because it goes up in the air and the trajectory makes the ball bounce high. And, and then the ball comes back because the ball does go above his opponent's shoulder returning. And then he's moving over and, He's got an extreme grip on the forehand side and he's going to hit it like he's throwing the discus, you know, so, so you know, serve plus one. Um, yeah, I think you, you think about, I've taught, I've been very fortunate in tennis. That's a luxury of tennis is to travel. I've been in all these different countries and you think about the fall of uh, the Soviet system, the USSR and, you know, tennis was an Olympic sport and it was downplayed in so many of the, you know, the puppet nations, but when you think, you know, they just have less, you know, they're, um, they're the hungry dog hunts best. Um, and you know, that's also too, and going back, I mean, you know, 
yeah, I tell kids, I used to go home and just hope that my mother wouldn't say, Stevie, if you could go out and bring the clothes in off the clothesline, and when you do that, put these up. And mm-hmm. I've lived in so many neighborhoods now where the zoning won't even let you hang up clothes in your backyard. <laughs> so, you know, less is more. I mean, oh no, we always use the dryer. You know, I don't think most tennis kids know that, you know, the dryer costs, it costs money. Hey, you know, why don't you, yeah. why don't you put the towels on a towel rack outside mm-hmm. and it, it will save everybody some money. So that word abundance comes down to it. Um, but I, mm-hmm. I think that back to the future and um, yeah, it's, you know, I also, another thing, you know, surplus one is I, I certainly don't like to hear the term old school, but speaking old, you're old, you still play. When are you going to go play a... <laughs> USTA, when are you going to go win a national title? Go play, say, an ITF. Take your wife on vacation. Of course, she... she I was going to do it. Uh, yeah, I was actually going to do it last year. That's what... I've, I've been hitting a lot of balls for the past four or five years. It's kind of in preparation for it. Beating up on old Boris, Andy, whenever he comes this way. There you go. Um, of course, but, uh, a coach from Germany who spends time in Dallas. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, but anyways, yeah, I, that was, that was kind of the plan. Severson got me, uh, motivated to try to get inside of that ranking where you get to go to the world. And he's, he's headed to Mallorca if mm. this year for the 65s. He's a two time world champ on the team end. And, uh, cool. But, uh, this year is going to be obviously on hold. I'll be rehabbing for, so I'll, I'll shoot for 2021. I, I, I was uh, wanting to go out to um, Palm Springs and play. They, they have a, a big ITF event out there kind of to start the year in late January. So Actually, we'll see. Uh, Hubert Crash, cool. he was in the lineup at Texas. I think he was a junior. He went to your place, played mm-hmm. in a money, money tournament, and you – practiced with him, played with him, and, and convinced him. He rebuilt his game. He was once uh, ranked number one in the 35s in the ITFs. But no. Yeah, he – Go ahead. Yeah, no, he was. He, uh, he, I tell you what, he he was playing high up at Texas with, you know, an example of heart and guts and fight. I mean, because he had, he had little or no technical base. Um, and, uh, I mean, he, he pounded it out not only – in his time with me, but I know he continued to when he connected with you and he really, he really was a hungry, hungry athlete in terms of acquiring knowledge and doing anything he could to get better. Yeah. With, uh, I, our listeners, uh, we've got people sending us questions to, what is it? In, info? Info at greatbasetennis.com. Well, one is, uh, to talk about brain typing, uh, you, David recently had a student visiting and I said, just go watch him demo. And, you know, so you've trench pro sunrise to sunset hour after hour, but you, you're as, as an ESTP, um, you like to compete. Um, mm-hmm. you know, like for myself as a J it's like, well, I, I need to practice for <laughs> six months and six hours a day. And with, uh, but no, I know that you've, continue to play all over the years. I think you should do that. Yeah, I will. I'm the first stop. We'll be down there to get a, get a match and humble a roosh. Yeah. Good. Let's, uh, let's wrap it up with a trivia question from a movie fits Uh, what percent of the time does it work every time? Oh, piece of cake. You got it. <laughs> Anchorman. <laughs> Sex Panther. Yeah. <laughs> Sixty percent of the time, it works every uh-huh. time. I'll tell you a story. Oh, I thought you were asking. I thought, yeah, no, I, yeah, sixty percent of the time, it works every time. Yeah, I all right. right. I'll yeah. tell you a story about Anchor Man. One of your students came to spend uh, time with us, did an internship, Gareth Ducre, and yeah. um, for some reason, I just don't, five one seven two five nine four. That's his phone number. I just don't get Anchor Man. So he 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 goes and sees it on a Friday. And he begs me, he tells me we have to go. So I, and I remember, um, um, Megan Broderick and Liberty Specky went the second night, you know, they both became very good tennis players. Uh, they spent a lot of years with us and the three of us, <laughs> I, I just didn't quite get anchorman. So uh, I'm, I'm lacking. You got to watch it a few times. 
How Baxter. many times have you seen it, Fitzhal? Several. Several. 22, 23? Uh, maybe not that many, but Actually, several. our listeners should know, is Fitzhal watches a movie one time and he starts walking around imitating the voices. I'm an NF, lines. speech and hearing. <laughs> I right. do the same thing, Andy. Well, we'll have fun the next time we connect. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, are you, a, you consider yourself a Rocky expert, Anderson? I... I I, I I have graduate degree for sure. With uh, well, there's I always tell Rocky one, two, three, and four. That's a college degree. Rocky five and six. They, they that's your grad your master's degree. They shouldn't have they should have gone Rocky seven and eight instead of Creed one and Creed two. I kind whatever. of like the Creed. I don't know. Yeah, but you don't understand. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> no, but I I've run a lot of workshops with Andy. You too, but I will do that as I'll say, okay, you tell me. I didn't hear no bell. Uh, my rings outside, and then you say what? And then the people have to tell you what Rocky it's from, and mm. then then you know if they're an expert, they can tell you from which Rocky the movies are. And actually, kids today, uh, they haven't even seen Rocky. Yeah, yeah. So no, most of them haven't. Sad, sad. But they don't know who Stefan Edberg is either. <laughs> yeah, I'll end on I'll end on a Stefan Edberg. My son Connor spent a lot of time in um, mispronouncing. I was over there too a couple of times. Vexho, Sweden. And they asked, you know, Fetter, uh, why don't you come to the net like Stefan? And he goes, I don't volley as well as he does. <laughs> no. Go ahead, Andy, you wrap it up. No, we just appreciate you being on our first uh, ever call-in guest. So thanks for your time. I'm happy know, to I be here, yeah. We, we went a while, but it's been great. I could always add one of, last thing. A lot of good Andy. insights. Yeah. Is, I, get up in a, I, get up in, I get up in an hour. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> when uh, I'll tell you this, when I my hair was thinning, I tell you the Lord works in mysterious ways because when my hair was thinning, a young ago. Dave Anderson was chirping and giving me a hard time about losing my hair. Thinning. I mean, I'll have to put a picture up of a young Dave Anderson out. on our Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I I have images of Steve's hair in that stage. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, we we got to end this, but. Old pictures of Steve was like Spicoli. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. I mean, yeah. It was uh, a little bit of a little bit of Spicoli. Nothing wrong with a little feast on our time. He went from Spicoli to Mr. Hand. <laughs> that's, exactly right. that's like uh, Anderson one and Anderson two. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. With, uh, I can't talk. Yeah, I do have some photos when I was a hockey player where I had hair to my shoulders. Good Those stuff. were the good old days. All right, Dave. Well, we appreciate it, and we'll be yeah. in touch. Well, thanks. Father Dave, okay. all the best to you and your family. All right. Thanks, guys. Have thanks, a good man. night. See you. Bye. All right. Well, great conversation with David. From the trenches. From the trenches. We hope David our Anderson. listeners uh, got a lot of value out of that. Thought there was a lot of great stuff. And that's the end of our episode. So, like always, you can find more information on our website, greatbasetennis.com. Find us on social media, at Great Base Tennis. And until next time, I'm Andy Fitzell, alongside Stephen Smith. Adios, amigos. Over we'll now. see you. Dos vidanya.